Καλησπέρα. Ε, η ομιλία μας σήμερα θα είναι δυστυχώς στα αγγλικά. Γιατί καταρχήν είμαστε καλεσμένοι από το Πολωνό Ιαπωνικό Ινστιτούτο και επίσης, ε, οπότε έχουμε και Πολωνούς και έχουμε και έναν Άγγλο που δεν μιλάει τίποτα. Ε, πέρα από αγγλικά προφανώς. Ε, οπότε όλα αυτά θα γίνουν στα αγγλικά. Ε, ερωτήσεις μετά στα ελληνικά, ό,τι θέλετε, κτλ. Very nice. Um, so, hello, good evening. Uh, it's really, really great to be here. Uh, thanks to Future Text for inviting us and Katerina for dealing with everything and Thanasis for finding us around the building so that we're getting easily lost. Um, we hope that we're not going to spend all this hour, probably we will, but we promise that it's going to be entertaining. It's going to have uh, music and colors and fun stuff, so you're not going to get bored, hopefully. Uh, not cookies, uh, maybe later, if you, if you are quiet and nice. Uh, so yes, I yeah, think so I hope you'll excuse any uh, amateur philosophizing that we come out with. Yeah, just we have an hour, so we have to do it. <laughs> so, let's start. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yep. What is it? Oh, um, we get the word text from the Roman writer Quintilian. This is not lorem ipsum. This is actually text in Latin, and we don't expect you to read it. It's just fancy to put something in Latin on, on screen. Um, Quintilian used the Latin word for weaving, uh, which is texo, and fabric or texture, which is textus, as a metaphor for the textures that we weave in the mind when we make sentences that are worth speaking and sentences that are worth writing down. If we accept Quintilian's concept of text as texture, we then regard text as connected sequences of chosen words, threads that knot together to become the abstract concept. The better the structure, the more memorable it is, and the longer it lasts. The text, then, is related to the ideas behind the words and is related to particular speeches and manuscripts, but yet it is not those things. The text can be delivered in many possible tones and can be presented in multiple ways. In speech, delivering the text with various intonations, various dramatic effects. In writing, creating manuscripts with various decorations, various ways of presenting the various specific hands suitable to particular content. We might call this polytony, many different tones, delivering a single text. After Gutenberg and the democratization of the means of reproduction, the audience has become significantly bigger. Each time we publish, we make at least a thousand copies of identical. We make at least a thousand of identical copies. The cost goes down and the production goes up. The text can now be delivered in many possible styles and can be presented in multiple ways. In print, delivered by different layouts and typefaces. Polyphony, many different voices delivered by various printers competing to express one text. Today, apart from books, we avidly consume text in our computers and our phones. Ironically, the new media brings us back to Quintilian's concept of text. Digital text, now fractured into Unicode code points, has regained its abstract form. The new typography is not an exquisite letterpress piece or even an InDesign document. It's a user interface style sheet. It's a responsive design encoded in CSS. The new typography presents unlimited numbers of text in the same stylistic expression, ready to adapt to devices of all sizes. The new typography presents unlimited number of texts in the same stylistic expression, ready to adapt to devices of all sizes. The new typographer is now a designer slash coder who transmutes aesthetics into logical structures. Along the new typography come new challenges. The typographic templates must foresee all the possible text that might be encountered. Does that mean that we are going to have monotony? one layout and typeface used by multiple texts.
Um, sorry. Let's see what has happened today with this uh, new typography. Well, designers were reluctant to prioritize the new media over print. Web design and user interfaces in digital media were not treated seriously as typography. Most websites weren't designed by trained typographers. Another important step was the resolution of these new media that finally caught up with print in 2012, pretty recently, with the introduction of high-definition retina screens on our laptops, on our phones, the designers could now choose from a large range of fonts for their layout, since now the subtle differences between one font and another was more noticeable, even on the smaller screens and smaller font sizes. The lack of a stable format, stable output format and output orientation made things more complicated still for layout design, especially after the revolution of the iPhone in 2007. This widely used device established the mobile phone as the place where in the future we'll consume most text. At the same time, updates to CSS for responsive web design made possible allowing one text to radically transform itself on each device to be most appropriately read. For the first 15 years of the web, the typeface choices for text were incredible it sounds, Today, they were limited to five typefaces. We call them now the web-safe fonts. They're installed on every computer. They're not necessarily the best fonts to use these days. But up till 2010, that, that was the case. In 2010, web fonts arrived, and the font choices for new media expanded massively. And combined with retina screens for their resolution, publishers could take text, make text much more readable, much more appealing. And then on the 14th of September 2016, OpenType 1.8 specification was announced. You may know that as the variable font format. The big deal about this update of the OpenType format, we can summarize it in the three things. Data efficiency. Uh, perhaps the main reason that this OpenType update happened. Data efficiency means less files, uh, and perhaps smaller size. So this is an example of Protipo typeface, Protipo family. In open type format, it contains 50 static font files. And this in uh, web fonts is exactly the same, 50 font files. But when we transform that into a variable font, we can have exactly the same choices with just three files. And they're exactly the same. And perhaps a tiny bit better. And this is the data. So this is how big these files are. So in the good old times, static fonts were almost five megabytes to have these 50 fonts. And now this can go down to 284K. So that means for web efficiency, that's the only way to go, actually, if you want to have many multiple choices. Um, another really important thing is flexibility. Flexibility is something that has been around uh, since 12, 2012. The respons uh, responsive web, web design with responsive uh, websites. Um, this is a responsive website, so things move in according to the size of the screen. Uh, if you don't understand why is this useful, because no one actually does that at home, uh, think about it, a display screen turning down into iPhone screen or to mobile. So the content needs to change. And if, you're Order and if you see the detail of the typeface at the bottom left there, we see that it's getting narrower and narrower to match the layout. So with the Farby font, you can do that automatically now. You don't have to switch styles of typeface every time you say 20% more squeeze, 20% more squeeze. It's going to do it automatically. It's going to take the um, measurement. Um, but also, it can do other stuff. So this is why the Farby font came to our lives. Uh, data efficiency, smaller sizes, flexible typefaces. But people actually got into that, uh, design studios, typeface designs, and start playing with it. And, and uh, just to remind you, this is just two years of work, okay? It's been exactly two years and a month, that's it. So it has been used for branding purposes.
so that's uh, Adi Neuer and Adi Neuer Chop by Jeremy Mickle. Um, this is actually used um, by Adidas in all their, in their stores worldwide. They're, they're from the marketing department. They had the desire to have personalized um, sports shirts. Personalized meaning you could have your own name on the back of uh, a shirt. And of course, some names have only four letters, some have 15. And so a font that can expand in width is perfect. And they installed a system on a thousand um, computers or so. So everyone around the world, every, every Adidas store around the world can generate these beautiful, these perfect, perfect typographic expressions. So the next one, uh, it has kind of double meaning. Uh, it's uh, the branding of a company that produced own system and they had installed stuff that was playing these things. actually reacts to sound. So machines with the typeface installed in the shops, uh, they could pick up the sound of the people talking next to them and they would display something different graphics. So the graphics were actually live and changing all the time. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, apart from brand identity and, and business and capitalism, uh, we also had cultural projects taking up on uh, where we could. And this is the Lowland Festival in Netherlands. It's an um, um, electronic music festival. And this is the brand identity of the illustrator Hansen. And she is into modular design. And together with uh, Jus van Rossum, uh, they designed this system that actually creates the letters from, uh, from different forms. And it changes color and shape throughout um, the, the graphic. Um, this is also very big font, but lots of programming inside. And this identity, these graphics that are automatically produced, uh, they were used for the branding or from stickers to clothes to tickets to anything, even to the design of the stages in this uh, open air festival. Um, the next, um, this is the credits. And the next, the more recent one is the um, um, Design Motion uh, Festival in Amsterdam. Uh, it's the second year that's happening. It happened a week ago and it takes place in the central station in Amsterdam. So you can see that um, this, this rabbit font allows you to adapt your branding or whatever is that closer to the product. So this is um, um, motion design. So it needed a, a, a typeface, something that was much more flexible than a static font that said the same information. But um, some fun projects. Should we go, oh, to, go to them? Sorry. And yes, of course, fun projects. Um, uh, this is a fun project that uh, I did, uh, I think, uh, one, two years ago, um, when I discovered that I can play with fonts. So that is uh, my first and hopefully my last 10-axis uh, variable font. Uh, it has only these four characters, and the, the, important, the important step for me was, it, first of all, is, is it possible? There was nothing more than that. Um, so that goes through 10 mainstream uh, typefaces, the basic design from Argus to Times, 
to Minion, to Greg Derua, and that were really fastly digitized by me. And the interesting thing about this kind of experiment is that you can see what do we get if we merge 10% uh, of Basque really with 20% uh, of Aldous. Uh, probably something bad, but you know, you never know. Um, so you can go through these things. Um, it can help you experiment and, and check the skeleton and how it reacts. Um, this is uh, Lawrence's uh, own fun project. Yeah, I had the idea of, uh, I've always been fascinated by the history of cinema. Um, and this particular emoji made me think that what if I could replace that with an animated version of the horse? Um, so this is the emoji you get in your iPhone, this uh, beautiful horse, but it's static. Um, so if you make a font and you tell it that so you just have a single character in your font, you give it that Unicode value, you digitize um, 15 frames that the photographer Mybridge uh, photographed in, a, in the 1880s, then, oops, sorry, yeah, then you get that. So, it, and this turns out to be an extremely efficient way of uh, delivering animation on the web. So this is a website. It's a really, really tiny website. The font itself came out at five kilobytes. Uh, the HTML and CSS, um, 200 bytes or something like that. So it's actually much, much smaller than if you'd made that as a movie file, if you'd made it as an animated GIF. And it's vector, so it scales up as, as big as you like, and you can adjust the speed and this kind of thing. It was fun. It's on CodePen, if anyone wants to take a look. Um, and these experiments, they're part of a fun project by a, a Dutch guy called Arthur Reinders Fulmer. He publishes under the name of Type Archer on uh, Twitter and Instagram. And he's done dozens, maybe 50 or so, color variable fonts. So color fonts was another development to font technology that came around about four or five years ago. He's combined them into these wonderful things. Um, and he's a great animator and great, has a great sense of humor. They're really worth checking out. So this, that face, by the way, was a four-axis color font. You can adjust, you have sliders on the screen, and you can adjust the glasses, adjust the nose, adjust the mustache. So apart from that, we have also new development. So people thought about it a bit more than uh, branding or identity or, or, or funny courses. And they thought, OK, we have a spec, we have a specification of 1.8, and maybe we can do things that we always want to do. Um, yesterday was a student in our workshop, and he wanted to do rotation. And this is what everybody wants to do, wants to rotate stuff and make things move smoothly around. Uh, the studio from Netherlands, Underwear, actually did that. They fiddled with the code, and they made Hoi. Hoi is a new way that you can actually animate things as smooth as an as, uh, illustration and, and efficient, much more efficient, in letters. So this is what they suggest. So this is an actual text that is writing itself. Um, it does use this variable font and it can be smooth because of the whole technology that they invented. Yeah, I mean, I think you've probably never seen text as smooth as this, hand-drawn text animated as smoothly as this, maybe in a Disney cartoon, but if you imagine the, the weeks it would take a Disney animator to create that, um, and this sort of thing is not possible in After Effects. You can't just, After Effects doesn't know the order of the strokes of each character, for example, um, let alone giving it Chinese. Underwear have actually programmed this into a Chinese font, so imagine seeing a, I think we'll see it in a second, a Chinese font self-writing. No, it's not in no, here. Okay, <laughs> that's on their website. Um, but this is the smoothest that we've ever, that, that humankind has ever digitized handwriting. It's, it's an amazing achievement. So Underwear was suggesting that we can do that, we can see this, the, the need of this thing in real life, uh, like the very importance of Instagram and Twitter. So it was about, the, their goal is actually to personalize the new media. So that's, that's kind of a step, a step backwards. You know, we have replaced calligraphy and handwriting with typefaces, but, if we, but what if we start doing typefaces into the beauty of the handwriting? And so this is an example of um, a use on a, on a media, on a Twitter or something like that. If you send a message and you choose the sign painter mode, 
and this meta message is going to be appear written on the screen directly with the hand of the sign painter. And that's still type. Okay, it's not magic, it's not uh, images, it's nothing. It's adaptable, you can write whatever you want. You can uh, copy and paste it and edit it. It's, it's really it's still type. And pro probably you can write uh, soon in more scripts than Latin. So, yeah, let's see. And the interesting thing that they showed in their last, latest presentation was what if all these things that are moving nicely, they, they are expressive and all that, what if these things start teaching us? stuff, as basic as handwriting. <laughs> so you can imagine that we have a typeface for every script that shows the kids how these things are drawn and it doesn't, it's not a silly video that things move. You can move it step forward and backward, you can see it step by step and, and but that would be really useful I guess. So it's not just filling in the shape, it's actually drawing the shape because if you if we could go really close you would see that this has ink spreading along as it goes. It doesn't go with the same well, length, the same width of the pen. It, it spread as it was really. Um, but our main consideration was a different one. Yeah, so this is all wonderful stuff, but it, it, we have a, there's a danger that we forget things. We forget that most of these experiments are just, you just represent the Latin script. We, uh, yeah, it's, and, and how many fonts don't have Greek, don't have Cyrillic, so there are plenty of existing serious problems, serious lack of choices for uh, Greek type typograph typographers that these fancy projects do not solve. Um, so there is a need to expand the character sets of, of our fonts, whether they're fancy or whether they're basic ones we use for branding uh, for text. Um, and globalization means that's even more necessary than ever before. And on the web, much more so than it was in print. So we always had print, uh, printing in more than one languages and one more script, from all dictionaries to recent uh, documentary catalog exhibition. It still the problem remains. We do have multi-scriptural and multilingual uh, typesetting. Um, so our question was always if uh, variable fonts can actually solve that. And we, ov we care about the web actually. So let's see what is the Greek uh, reality of the web. Um, so, sorry, where are we here? Yeah. Um, right, so let's, let's see what happens um, if, if for a Greek uh, web typographer. Um, yeah, so what are the, font, what are the choices? We've, um, we've highlighted four major places to get fonts for the web. There's Google, top left, font stand, top right, um, Adobe fonts, that used to be called Typekit, on the bottom left and what's the other one? That's a type network on the bottom right. So they all have thousands, some, some of them tens of thousands of fonts to choose from. And by the way, these are web fonts, okay? So it's not just normal fonts, they are fonts that you can embed on your website and everyone can see it. So let's overlay, overlay these with the statistics of how many of these are available in Greek. So on the right hand is the number of the Greek typeface available and uh, we're talking about, these are numbers for text ser uh, serif fonts. Um, Yes, serif fonts for text. And the other is the, the number in Latin. So you can see that the Greeks are not really... Yeah, so in Google we have a horrific ratio of 1 to 100. Um, um, and yeah, that, that situation is improving very slowly, but it's still a, a really, really bad ratio. Um, so what happens um, when, these, when people choose fonts and then expand into new markets like Greece or like Russia? It's, um it happens something like that. So you see, this is the Nike com website, very nice, all in English. And all of a sudden, you choose your country of origin and you want to go to Czech Republic. But no, you cannot really go. You go with an ugly accent on top because the typeface doesn't support that. And if you want to go to the Greek shop, you get Ariel because you know that's the only choice you get. Yeah. So those characters are missing from the web, the lovely web font that they've chosen. So the C with a hat check on top and all of Greek 
is missing. Another uh, fun example is the Barilla website that uh, someone actually got into the pain of translating this uh, text, whatever it says about pasta and sauces, uh, but then again, it forgot to choose a typeface for the Greek. So the typeface that you get for the Greek text has the Latin pieces in perfectly nice, and it has the me and the p, uh, part of usually the Latin fonts for mathematical purposes, so they didn't really care just a tiny bit and forgot the rest of uh, 24 letters, it's just these were there already. And depending on the browser, you can get funny results. Now here's uh, Kellogg's. Uh, so in, when you're coding your website, you can say, actually when you say your font family in your CSS style sheet, you can say, what do I want to choose if there are no characters? And you can say, do I want a serif font or a sans serif font? You have this really basic choice as a fallback. Uh, Kellogg's didn't even bother to set that. So Safari chose its default fallback, which is Lucida. That's on the left. And Firefox chose its default fallback, which is Times. Uh, so the font failed in both cases, but failed differently. So what are these fonts that they actually appear out of nowhere? Okay, we chose our Kellogg's um, dot font, ours font, blah, blah, but it chose times. Um, so oh, another example is PayPal. Um, the, the bottom, uh, it's, it's Polish, uh, and uh, anyway, it's the PayPal typeface, the typeface that PayPal actually paid to design customly. And for the Greek, they forgot about it again, and we see Helvetica. Um, so you, you, you have all that. It, it's very common. It took us around uh, five to six minutes to find this website. We didn't do any research. It's yeah. everywhere. So it, it's really funny. Um, or sad, it depends. Um, so where do these things come from? Um, when the websites, when the CSS code of a website says use myphone.com, and this myphone doesn't have then it's characters for the script or the language that you support. It's going to go back to the, fall, to the fallback fonts. Fallback fonts are not chosen by us. They're just sitting in our systems. And this is what it sits in our system. So if you have a Macintosh computer, it's going to have Times. If you have Windows, it's going to have Times New Roman, a different design. If you have Ubuntu and you're a hacker, you're going to have Liberation Series. And these are for mobiles. So this is what always going to come back when you say, turn down to a serif font if I don't have the, the, the correct typefaces. So uh, we were really bothered about that, and we thought that um, variable fonts are fine, but perhaps can save us. Somehow. So var yeah, variable fonts, they're saving space on the web, but they're adding flexibility, but could they be applied to this problem? And uh, today we'd like to show you our solution, our experimental solution, I should say, uh, for incomplete character sets. And it does use the standard technology of open type variable fonts. It combines it with the ideas of the Type Network company. Um, David Burlow at Type Network conceived a series of very well-defined variable axes that measure fonts in, like an engineer would or like an architect would. So it's not, not a subjective way to measure fonts. It's a very objective one, like with a ruler. Um, a faux foundry currently is about fonts um, that lack Greek characters. That's the problem it's addressing. It's a way to produce Greek fonts on the fly. Greek fonts that match any Latin serif font that you give it. And faux foundry, at the end of all that, gives you the CSS code that you then add directly to your website so that it supports Greek harmoniously. It's based on a single variable font a parametric variable font, we call it. And as I say, it's solving the problem of missing character sets, language support, when the original font lacks those characters. And we should say our purpose is not to replace real typeface design, it's to offer a solution that's better than nothing. We hope it's significantly better than nothing when there is no alternative. And it's about giving the readers a less compromised typographic experience. Uh, and as I say, it's just Greek at the moment. We have ideas about expanding that to uh, other scripts. And it's just about serif fonts. But the idea applies nicely to sans as well. Um, and we're going to take you through how it works, which is basically best explained by going through three different aspects um, of faux foundry. And that's faux grec, the typeface, counterfeiter, 
the measuring <coughs> system, and FauxForger, the font building system right. on the server. And we're going to look at them one by one. So start with FauxGreg. So we try to make it as simple as possible because uh, that can get really geeky. Um, so basic stuff, typeface. Uh, the system uses only one typeface. So to, to make it simply what Lauren said, we have a one website. You drag and drop a Latin font that it doesn't have Greek and the website gives you a Greek. Okay, it's as simple as that. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to tell how you like it. The system decides for you. I'm sorry, I, I decided for that. So, uh, the font. The font. The font is a parametric font, as we said before. Uh, the idea, the proposal of uh, the parametric variable font comes from Type Network and the Perlo. Uh, maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Uh, you should know them. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting proposal and um, not very technical as it looks, actually. I can, I'm going to go through the proposal myself, so we'll see. So, uh, until now, only two fonts have been designed like that, plus ours. And these are Amstelvar and Roboto Extremo. They are free on GitHub, you can download them and you can go crazy. Um, so, for Greg. For the for Greg, we decided to have a serif, upright, low contrast basis. Um, obviously, the option, the, the first idea was sans or serif, and we said, come on, sans, well, we can do sans. Uh, let's see if we can do serif actually. And we started just with the biggest challenge uh, to see, uh, to prove a point actually. And we hopefully we made that point. Um, the skeleton, maybe you don't like this design, you shouldn't necessarily like it, you're not going to see it, you're never going to use it. Because this design is based on all the system fonts and all the serif fonts that you get every day in your face, you like it or not. From uh, Minion to uh, New York to Cambria to Times to Times New Roman, to all the serif default typefaces that you use for InDesign, for Word, for your ebooks reader, the serifs. So our design, we want it to be flexible and we want it to be simple, not to have too much character because that couldn't be adaptable to many various different serifs. So what the typeface does, uh, this is the normal weight thing, okay, everybody understands that. It goes from regular to some kind of uh, heavy weight. And this is a width, it goes from regular width to uh, uh, a big width. And this is a fancy optical size, you know, you have titles, you want something more delicate. So the contrast uh, uh, becomes more extreme. Um, but let's see how these things actually work, because this is a synthetic thing. We don't have a weight axis. A weight axis doesn't mean much, actually. What it would mean is that the, the vertical black stems do change. So we have one parameter. Second parameter, the horizontal stems. You see the black parts, they go up and down, up and down thing. And then we go through the white places of the letter, the gap inside that expands and reduces. And then we have the X height, because X height changes in type phase. And the easy part, ascenders. You know, uh, the tall zeta, uh, shorter zeta. And the ascenders. And then the, what is that? The, the, the uppercase the, the height. Uppercase, uh, uh, height. So what we want to do is we break down the typeface in black and white elements, vertical and horizontal. David Berler says that is enough, and uh, we do believe that, and we can prove it. That well, that we didn't think it was quite enough. So yeah, we didn't actually think it was quite enough for the Greek. So what we did is we split the first three axes into uppercase and lowercase, and we also added an extra uh, axis for the serif. So the serif. Okay, the only thing we could do is to have a bracket serif and um, a The slab, how thick you want your slab and how so tall you want your bracket. goes like that. Okay, so we can control that separately from other things and separately the blacks and the whites of the other days. And the last one? Yes, that was the last one with the serifs. Yeah. So we introduced four new parameters and we wrote to David Perlow and we wrote that network and they said, yay! Pretty cool. So they adapted it to their new proposal. 
So now if you go to see the parametric fonts, you're going to see, of the, of the video, you're going to see um, also the breaking down in uppercase, lowercase, and numerals. Because all these things have different origins. At least in, 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 in Latin and Greek they do, so they need different treatments. And numerals are a different kind of uh, crazy monster, so you do need to control these things differently. So when we have a change of a weight in our parametric font, we activate three parameters. It's not just one, it's three. It's the horizontal blacks, the vertical blacks, and the horizontal white. When we have width, it's just two, two of them. But if you see, they, they move with a different speed. The black, the white of the, uh, sorry, the, the horizontal white in the width moves much faster than the increasement of the black part. Because when you make something condensed, you do increase the white space, but you make it a tiny bit lighter to match optically your regular weight. So, optical seats. And uh, now, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's how the font is controlled. Um, and we've seen it with these 12 axes. That's how you control for Greg. Um, but imagine giving 12 controls to a graphic designer. This is not going to go well. Um, so we need to control those axes automatically. And we need to get those 12 parameters automatically from a given Latin font. So that's what we do. Um, we, uh, we render certain key characters. Um, as bitmap images, we render them inside the web browser on a so-called canvas element at a pretty large size. And then we use uh, some fairly simple JavaScript code, some a different algorithm for each uh, measurement, to measure. There we're measuring the x opaque value, which is the code for the width of the vertical stem. And now we're measuring the y opaque, the width, the thickness of the horizontal stems. There, there is a thin red line. I don't know if you can see it. This is the measurement, actually. Oh, yeah, you see it in the transparent <laughs> okay, you one. Can see the transparent. So that's the measurement we take. So we me we're measuring that in pixels. And then we're applying a simple scale factor to bring it up to the units that are used in the font and used in our axes. Um, and we're just taking these 12 numbers out of each Latin font that we, we give to Faux Foundry. And that is Counterfeiter's job, to take these 12 numbers. And then what does it do with those 12 numbers? It's going to send them to the server to ask for a font. And that's, the for, that's the for, what we call Faux Forger section. Uh, so it has 12 parameters that it needs. Uh, it's sitting on the server. It's not accessible directly as a web font. We, have, we decided not to release it publicly. I mean, at this stage, if this was a variable font in your browser, it would just pop to the, um, to the right shape. But we decided to keep it on the server for various reasons. Anyway, so here are the 12 values. They're fed into the Fogrec. That's the first stage on the left. Then they go through various st fairly standard tools on the server, and out pops a web font at the far end with some CSS. The web font is really tiny. It's about five kilobytes. Um, it only contains the Greek upper and lowercase uh, with diacritics. Um, the CSS is then what you take and put on your website. And that's, that's it. You have a harmonious Greek font. So this is a demo video. Uh uh, we tried it a uh, live demo before, it wasn't so fun. Uh, this is funnier. So that describes all the steps of Four Foundry and how it works.
this tunnel there is off and on for break. So this is what you would get before you have full on break, before you get full break. You have it from two of times and you total it like this. And it's times because we're using a The first time we presented this project was uh, in Japan uh, in September. Patras. Uh, Patras was a beta, but the official, official <laughs> release uh, was in Japan. And we had made this uh, booklet specimen uh, that says uh, basic stuff about Four Foundry and uh, basic, uh, the, the three parts that Four Foundry uh, has okay. contained. Um, yeah, some pages. Uh, so this is a sample page of the Latin and the fake Greek next to it. Um, so this time, with the help of Future Techs and Katerina, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We have a new specimen that uh, some of you already took, and it has more or less the same text, plus an addition for Future Text, plus a translation by me in Greek. Hopefully, it's not horrific. Um, if it is, uh, let me know. Uh, and it also, it has uh, the second updated version of our Greek, because our first one had some problems, uh, but this one is a tiny bit better. So please um, take uh, a specimen, have a look, tell us what you think. And the future, or now, or whatever. So, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're, it made us think about all the things we could, what directions we could take it. So obviously a sans serif uh, version would be an interesting way to take it. An italic we need to do as well uh, for it to be um, fully, fully harmonious with a wide range of, of Latin. Um, people ask us about um, other scripts, and we've had offers to help uh, with, uh, with Hebrew, with uh, Cyrillic, um, and a Georgian somebody wants to do as well. So we, we may well be working with um, other people to, you know, we're not, we can't do those scripts at it's all. Definitely not going to do another one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it'd be interesting to work with others to um, expand the possibilities for other scripts. Uh, fine tuning, some people want to fine tune the results. Uh, we're currently not going to allow that, but it's a possibility for the future. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's, a, it's not difficult for us to give you control of the typeface, it's just you really don't want the control of the typeface. Uh, you can check uh, Roboto Extremo and Amstelberg that are already there, and you are going to find really difficult time to decide a good instance and a good um, like yeah, a, if you, a if you control be, these things manually, yes, you, you it's easily it's get it's into amazing. areas uh, that are that become ugly. So we we ha happily have that under control. Um, uh, yeah, we are, we are thinking also to make it an open source project. So any of you, whoever around the globe, can uh, help us because uh, it is a massive project. It can get massive. It is definitely difficult. Uh, but in to a lighter note, uh, our main worry was if anyone is going to use it. And, and yes, uh, we were happy, we are happy to announce that uh, <laughs> our friends and uh, items underwear do actually use it in their website, Font, uh, Font Fiction. And Font Fiction is a website uh, that underwear published uh, their story, their, their, their theory about uh, reviving typefaces. So this text was translated in many languages. But all of a sudden, the Greek, of course, didn't have uh, the typeface that we're using, Dolly. 
Yeah, um, Dolly, beautiful typeface, no Greek. So uh, that's so where we, appearing, we can come beautiful in. Beautiful text, blah, blah, perfect. And then uh, you see that. So you don't really want that. And so they played around and they decided that this is the for Greg uh, for Dolly. So for Greg is online uh, in a real kind of project. And no, not considered for the future. <laughs> it was the same as now. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we love Poland, so uh, on our way to Japan. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us, and we're here for questions. Yeah. Thank you.